Welcome to the show today. Today we have Ursula Sorić Renier on the show and uh, she's the CIO of Sulzer and I'm very excited to talk to you today. Hear a bit more about your story about uh, what's exciting right now and uh, your picture of the future where things are heading. So let's dive right into your story. First of all, who is Ursula and uh, what got you to where we are today? What's the story behind Ursula? So thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to uh, join my story here. Um, Yeah, who am I? I'm a curious person that actually just grabbed opportunities that were offered. And that led me to actually become an earthling where I lived in six countries uh, um, in this world. I worked in five. My husband's American. My son was born in Belgium. So I think I'm I'm a modern gypsy in that sense. Um, I love the diversity of the different cultures and, and then, you know, having the impact or the possibility to actually reach the different people and achieve common results. Um, yeah, it led me from, you know, originally Vienna and Austria over to Scotland, over to then uh, within uh, Philips Electronics, 15 years, four countries. I think it was three or four divisions, which also allowed me to learn and grow. I didn't always uh, work in IT. I also worked as a product manager for high-end television sets at that point in time. You know, the mechanical, electronic parts became less and software became more dominant. Um, then uh, led me over to the U.S. and then uh, to Novartis, where... I had a strategic role for over four years and then a headhunter call basically brought me now to Sulzer in Switzerland. Very, very good. Excellent. So um, I love what you mentioned in the beginning um, and it went very much into leadership. I'd love to have a little bit of a discussion there in terms of um, leadership. Now, you're in charge of a large organization and there's always lots of things happening especially when things are growing and expanding. Now, my favorite question in terms of leadership is really how do you how do you lead such a large organization and still stay sane at the same time? You know what? Stand for what you believe in. Be authentic. If you're authentic, then you don't need to make things up and who you told what. Then you can actually drive the topics. You can drive the objectives you can drive the goals that you laid out actually quite consistently across it is then about you know getting everybody on board and all in their own way you know everybody's getting motivated you motivate an american a german an indian a singaporean slightly different and that is fine we all have our own drivers in the end you know the achievements as an organization are important, which then generate a positive spin in order to achieve even more. So I think it is, uh, for me, very, very important to be direct, open, to listen, but then also decide when needed. That is also leadership. And, and actually, sometimes it is better to take the wrong decision now then no decision at all, because if you're open and willing to adjust and, you know, improve and also adapt, then, you know, a bad decision you actually generate at least learnings from. And with these learnings, you can improve it along the way. And um, that I think worked so far because it is about, you know, generating this within this group IT in these 24 countries to generate this function identity and also this enablement of, of support to each other because only together we're strong. And um, I think that was the, the one thing that really we accomplished in the last five years. And it was also one of the reasons why we were so successful. Now, I, I, I love that. I mean, one, one topic that um, you specifically touched on now is this topic of diversity you know talking about lots of different cultures i mean what is what is your take on diversity obviously diversity is always in in a in in a sense you know more women in you know leadership positions more women in in uh in in anything basically 
And, uh, you know, I'm a big proponent of that because I believe we need more balance, so to say, not just one-sided. It's not either man or woman. It's, you know, magic happens when those sides come together, obviously, <laughs> also in, in nature. Um, and, I mean, I'm just curious, like, your, your perspective. What's your perspective on diversity, but more on what is the what is your perspective on the impact on an organization on diversity? What do you feel... Why is diversity important from a culture perspective, also from a gender perspective, for an organization in terms of the impact? I think different opinion make an aspect better. And that's the bottom line for me of diversity. We don't all think the same. Um, and they're very you know, detailed gender reports and studies about, you know, from, you know, how a baby plays, you know, a, a female baby plays with a doll versus the other one, or, and of course, those are generalizations. And so even within that, it is about getting actually a lot of opinions on the table, which doesn't make it necessarily easier sometimes. So you do have to work through it. But you then come out, I think, with a much richer and much more, you know, better coverage than from a global aspect when we talk about solutions for a company. And uh, if you talk about really solutions that do work, then this balancing between, you know, global, from standardization, from the scaling, from, you know, all these different, uh, you know, financial efficiency aspects versus then... But what is then important locally um, and how can it all work together? That's where it needs to come together. I think business also nowadays is about actually nurturing certain friction interfaces which are there, just naturally there. Um, but then that is actually a good you know, interface, a good you know, debate and something better comes out. Love that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it makes things a bit more complex sometimes, but the kind of richness and the texture, I guess, of what comes out is ways beyond anything that is monotone. I love that very much. Now, um, once again, on, on the topic of um, leadership in terms of, you know, uh, there's so many different styles out there and different ways of, you know, leading, managing, whatever. What would you describe as your, you know, natural way of going about leadership? I like to have fun. I want to do something that I enjoy personally. So I'm actually, you know, really believing in what I what I then push. And uh, yeah, what is it? It for me, it's a, it's all about teamwork. Uh, that is very important. If you know you want to control everything, then you might as well do all the other jobs and then you cannot scale yourself. So if you want to be successful, you also need to be able or need to learn the balance of where to let go and where to still apply control. Um, you know, when you, when you walk through the four steps of leadership and you contribute individually in a team through others, and that's a big step, right? And, and I think there, you know, you see if there's good leadership, if they really scale themselves as leaders, allow others to, to step in, you know, to take the empowerment, run with it, yet they'll be a team from, you know, a common approach or perspective. And, um, yeah, it's, it's an ongoing balancing where you need, you know, regular adjustments or agreements. But then, you know what, when you when you achieve the scale where the different teams and the different groups and the managers feel empowered enough in order to run, then you have the multiplication factor of a, of a team. I, I love that. I mean, there's lots of golden nuggets in there in terms of wisdom. I, I'm just curious, like, did you learn this all from a book or did you have some interesting experiences uh, along the way that, uh, you know, um, elevated you to that level of consciousness about leadership and if the second one is the case <laughs> what were i mean what, what were some of the maybe one or two or three stories that 
you could talk about that really made a huge difference in the way you look at leadership it, from a positive side in terms of it completely sort of like you know blew your mind in a, in, a, in a very positive sense that you had a great experience or either a bad or a great experience I think it's always a compilation of a lot of experiences. I had the phenomenal opportunity to also have uh, some good mentors and coaches. Uh, it's a you know compilation of actually you know good friends that call you up and say you know what in that last meeting that was crap right, or you have you know other people that you can observe in in certain settings. And I'm, I'm not so sure if I can point to one thing that made me who I am, but it is from being inspired from a person that talked for an hour on two slides over certain, you know, aspects. You know, it starts with your own parents, basically, who help you, how you view life over, you know, mentors and coaches that mean well with you and also give you the critique, you know. Typically, you know what, the, you know, the good stuff you hear very easily, but constructive criticism, that's a gift nowadays. That's the hard part to get, but only that makes you better. Um, yeah, failures on all levels actually educate you quite a bit. And, um, yeah. and then, you know what? Taking actually life as a learning opportunity. If you see it that you want to grow and you don't want to stand still, but you, you want to you know, progress, then I think it's a natural thing that you know all these things flow together and you become the leader that you 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 are now. Yeah, I love that you become the leader that you actually are. I love that. I love that quote there. That's really good. That's really really good. Um, I mean, there's so much passion and energy that you radiate, you know, and uh, I mean, there's lots of leaders out there who are so frustrated and stuck in things and there's their energy is dead. And uh, when we first talked, I mean, I just felt that that's, you know, one reason I wanted to have you on the show uh, because it's the Aligned Leader Show, right? So I'm just curious with, you know, with that energy, there's, you know, a reason why you go to work every day. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, what is that? What's, what's the reason you get up every morning, go to work and do the difficult things you do? every day, you know, go through the challenges that, you know, are there every day, obviously all the accomplishments, but what is that reason? What's, what's the why behind? Well, I want to, I want to, you know, I want to have an impact. And, and actually also a big motivator of me actually climbing the career ladder was that the higher you go, the more you can define actually, you know, the, the atmosphere, for example, of your team. And you can allow, you know, nerve guns to be shot at or so it's 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 a sense of of I want to have the right impact maybe. And that so to say really jointly together, because, you know what, when you have good news, you want to share it with somebody. And so having actually a success as a team is so much more fun than just by yourself. I, I, I love that also, you know, the motivation for climbing the ladder. Most of the time it's, well, everything else but what you just mentioned. Um, <laughs> and I love that as a motivation. And it gets me to another question. Like, you know, you mentioned getting higher up. Also, you can have a bigger impact. And we talked about diversity before, which kind of like that combination brings me to a question that I always wanted to ask in terms of boards um, and women on boards of large organizations, medium-sized organizations. Look at, I mean, look at Switzerland, there's a tiny percentage, maybe 10% uh, of all the seats of large S SMI companies are on basically, uh, you know, there's, there's maybe 10% women on, on, on those boards. I'm curious, like, what's your perspective? What do you feel would be the impact um, if that number would maybe double or triple uh, on boards, on actual boards of these organizations? Do you, do you think there would be any impact at all? None at all? And if there would be, what kind of impact do you feel that would have? So I want to actually, you know, position this a little bit different because it's not really all about women. And I actually want to bring it to the topic where I am busy in, which is a big topic for me, 
I think there's too little technical understanding or leadership in boards on average. And that needs to be a mixture with a female perspective, with others. I think that, so to say, a diversification in, um, you know, because in the, in the board, you know, the, the governance, compliance, financials, and I am generalizing here are in, in many cases dominating. And if we, you know, in, in many cases, strategy is, of course, a big topic. But in many cases, I think more strategy can come back. And then you need to say more holistic perspective on also all the other areas that are impacting currently the company or will impact. And digital transformation is actually a huge topic. And I'm not so sure if all the boards have the right expertise in order to there give the guidance or advice that is needed. Um, maybe, you know what, I was thinking about lately that maybe through cybersecurity, which is really a compliance or risk management aspect, maybe through that door, IT expertise can enter the board more easily at this point in time. I think if that expertise or if that diversity comes, I think it will be very beneficial. There are studies out there that in mixed teams, uh, there's more success actually and also impact, economical impact for a company. Yeah, I, I, I very much like that way of looking at diversity very much, you know, not just from a fe female male perspective, but well, much, much broader there, cultures and, you know, backgrounds and technical abilities and things like that. Very much in this changing age where, you know, boards that were established 20 years ago may not be, you know, the right um, pure expertise right now that is needed. And uh, I love that. I love that perspective. Now I want to move a little bit into the present uh, in terms of what you're up to, um, you know, and, and, and what's going on right now. Uh, either in the industry, in the organization, anything you can basically share. What's most exciting for you right now? So it is digital transformation, but it's a very broad term. I would like to be a little bit more specific there. Um, I think nowadays we have a possibility to automate and collaborate in a way that, you know, what will improve the bottom line so significantly. And you see the first impacts in banks and insurances, but it is also on our side where you can really now uh, start to understand if you really integrate processes, if you automate processes. Just in my IT environment, when you look in areas of DevOps or, you know, bots that then help you in incident management, there is a significant uh, change or, you know, in, in faster and better, if we can name it. Uh, that's the bottom line. The, the other side is, is also equally important. It's the top line growth. And their B2C, I think, is much more advanced. Uh, in the consumer side, digital transformation has happened significantly faster or already many years. In a B2B environment, for example, we are, you know, almost uh, over 40% in oil and gas. That's a very different perspective. But also there you see that um, the interactions are becoming more digital. This, this collaboration, this communication with each other. Uh, for example, in the field service, augmented reality is something that we consider uh, as a significant game changer for us. Either the customer has uh, glasses that we can immediately see directly, you know, what is there happening with the pump or a gas turbine or another rotating equipment um, device um, piece. Or we have augmented reality glasses that we go to the customer and we have somebody in the background who is say, really the expert actually that can help in diagnose or in analysis or in training support just providing a quote for example based on something that you see is much um uh much more concrete and accurate than just you know um so the top line growth, the bottom line growth, and the third thing that I would like to mention separately are business models. 
And uh, it is interesting that when you look back, many of the business model changes were a little bit forced upon, forced upon through people couldn't afford capital investments anymore. Or uh, sh so shift in financial market, shift in, you know, priorities also for companies, you know, CapEx versus OPEX or other aspects. Um, yeah, I think it's a very fascinating world out there. Um, industrial manufacturing, I mean, just a poor pump is quite a, you know, you know, a piece that is not intelligence by itself. It is, of course, in the solution, in the environment, in combination with the other equipment. And to then look into this and make this more efficient, make this smarter, is actually a fascinating challenge. I love that. I, I love, once again, the energy you have behind this there. And, uh, you know, especially also in, in, in the more heavy industries, I find it also very fascinating, like what kind of impact um, there is because I mean you know for a long long time many of the things have been fairly dumb in terms of the assets right and now suddenly everything everything not just our phones become smart and I find that incredibly interesting where things are heading which leads me kind of like a little bit into the future there I mean where do you see thing, things are going I mean one thing you mentioned is augmented reality sort of like how that could be applied um, in the very near future already or maybe already today um, where do you where do you see uh, things will be heading in the next one, two, three, maybe up to five years in that, you know, in that industry you're in, in terms of digital. Do you see some, you know, specific areas that will go under massive transformation that you already, you know, more or less can foresee or? You know what, so say there's different tipping points for different, uh, you know, technologies or behaviors or processes or yeah, interactions. I'm not so sure if I'm able to foresee the tipping point, but <laughs> but I think there are common denominators and those are trends that are not stoppable, reversible. And that is number one, this individualization, you know, this I am particular in my needs, dear company, can you cater fully to those? And then not only cater to those particular but now, or when I want it, this on-demand, you know, actually my son, um, having grown up in the U.S., he doesn't know anything else than on-demand. He's never watched real television where, you know, you have to wait till Tuesday, 7 p.m., I don't know. Um, and thirdly, this omnipresence, mobility anywhere uh, where you want. These are so say so-called mega trends. In these mega trends, I also would like to add that on top, it is more from kind of like the the owning environment to an experiencing. I think we're entering in an experiencing society where it is more important, you know. What you what you've done, what you've seen, you know, here this cool, this there, then then you know something that you just um, yeah. I mean, look look how many young people's goal in life is to own a big expensive car, less and less. Driving you know on a Sunday a Porsche around and I don't know. You know, sport environment. Yeah, that's that's the experience you want to have, right? And that's I think where we see a societal shift. And we as companies, we all need to cater to this. B two B maybe slower in itself, but um, just the same. Love that. It's a really interesting area. Specifically, it's you know, partly is in the industry itself, but partly is much much more broad in terms of how digital in general impacts the way we go about life essentially and uh, I find that really interesting now just as a last question there is there some sort of a mantra that you have for life or business or leadership or anything that you know is able to put into one sentence or into a few words where you say well this is sort of my thing this is sort of my my uh, my life slogan
it's all about people. Mm. What does that mean for you? Um, to, in order to make something successful, and for example, as CIO, to turn around Salter, to centralize it, to make it operational stable, to introduce new services and bring digital on the agenda, you need to have people that actually do this. That means you need to energize or motivate enough people that join you actually in this agenda, on this agenda and help you, you know, make it come to fruition. And that's why I'm saying it's all about people. And uh, if, if they don't join you, if they are not on the same page, it will not happen. Because if you have forces working against each other, that's, that's not uh, the recipe for success. And so that's why I'm saying it's all about people. If, if you can create this, you know, common sense, it's it's incredible how much you can do and how fast i love that love that so thank you so much for sharing that wisdom sharing those nuggets your experience uh on the show really appreciate it i'm gonna link below uh the video to the uh resources like you know the solster page and also where people learn a bit more about you um once again thank you so much for the interview it was a pleasure thank you too have a good day